Good morning. Good morning to everyone. It's always impressive to be in this room. I've already been here five times making presentations. So if you don't mind, I like memorizing these moments. I'm going to take a photo of you guys, if you don't mind. I hope no one has anything against it. But <laughs> Really impressive, just for my memories. So I've been asked to talk about the future of work and what it means for TVET, but I'd like to start by thanking, first of all, the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics uh, for having invited the commission here, as well as the Basque authorities, and the Basque in particular for the hospitality. I think you're all enjoying the good weather, the nice food in the Basque country. This is typical. Come here again, even for holidays. Wonderful place. And what I'd like to start with today is with um, a short video from Skills Development Scotland. I chose this among many other videos I could choose because it shows how Scotland is preparing talent for the big transitions, the digital and green transition. So share just a few minutes with me with this presentation. Doesn't seem to work. Let me see. Good. Good. So I, I thought of starting with this uh, video because it shows that although we are facing tremendous challenges, and I think they're the same in China, in Europe, in, uh, in Canada, Australia, that there are solutions, and in particular Scotland is finding by investing in people, in talent, having the human at the center of everything they do. Now, I would like to engage with the audience. You know that you have free Wi-Fi here in uh, Kursal, so if you don't have uh, uh, a mobile connection, you can go and just connect very quickly because I need your participation. I need you to engage in this. So if you can please get your mobile phones out and uh, make sure you have an internet connection. And then you can just either go to slido.com and when it asks you for the event, you put WFCP 2022. Or if you want, just take a photo of that QR code. It should take you to the website. Can you please do that? Because I'll need your participation here. 
Okay, I hope you've done it, but if, uh, if you haven't done it yet, just remember slido.com WF, uh, WFCP 2022. Now, the first question I have for you is, what is the first idea that comes to your head when we, say, we talk about the future of work? Now, I just need you to, in two words, you can, do, uh, you can reply various times, but just in two words, to tell me what comes to your mind when you think of the future of work. I've only got one response until now. I hope you guys managed to go into Slido. Are you managing to get there? It's not working. Oh my God. No problem. I'm really sorry about this. It should have been easy. If you go to, have you gone to slido.com? It says no connection. I'm really sorry for that. Okay, so, but let's go ahead. We have an alternative. It's, it's really, I would have hoped you could engage. Are you managed? Okay, some people are managing, but I don't see the results coming up. Ah, connection, there's some problem with the reconnection. Okay, let's not let this stop. This is it. We have to adapt to, to difficulties and challenges, and we'll just go ahead. But uh, the question I had is, what will be the future of work? And the message I'd like to pass with you is that, you know, everyone seems to know what is the future of work. Some people say that because of the gig economy that, uh, you know, uh, people, most of the people will be freelancers, will not have a, a permanent job any longer. You've got, you know, various perspectives of the future. Some people saying that automation, and we're talking about res reputable uh, uh, agencies, the OECD, the Oxford University, predicting what will be the impact of loss of jobs because of automation. And you get things from 9 to 47 percent. Which one should we believe? So the idea about the future of work, everyone has idea, but what I wanted to tell you, the message I wanted to pass with the slide, is that there's a lot of uh, uncertainty. You get a lot of scenarios depending on who you talk with and who conducted the study. So there's a lot of uncertainty about the future of work. It's very difficult for us to be precise of what exactly it will look like. We know it will change, and that's for sure, but we don't know exactly what it is. Now, I had another question for you. If the slide hadn't betrayed me and the things would be working well, which what, what was your idea of the uh, future of skills, or what will be the skills necessary in the future. Unfortunately, it doesn't work, but that doesn't stop us. And you know, once again, if just preparing for this conference, I went into Google, and I you know, asked them, what, what's the future of skills? And as you can see there, you've got as many futures as as many people you ask, because things change a lot. You've got a lot of possibilities here, as you can see, but then you go into see how some organizations say, then you know, re reputable organizations like McKinsey, they've identified 56 foundational skills in four big clusters. And all of them are valid. I'm not saying they're not valid. But you see, they have a vision of what will be the skills of the future. If you go and look at uh, manpower, for example, they've got another vision of what are these future sk soft skills. And then if you even go further, you, uh, you see the World Economic Forum, they've just updated the skills for the future, the 10 top skills for the future. But the same organization, if you go five years back, they had a different vision of what were the top skills. And of course, they are, some of them, coherent. But just to tell you that even within the same organization, when we talk about the future of skills, it's not permanent. You know, things are constantly changing. So it's very difficult for us in the education system to really identify what should we be teaching. But this is to show you the same organization itself. Every five years, they update this. And as you can see, even there, they change their minds about what are the future skill needs. So, and another thing I wanted to share with you is that we quite often talk about the future of skills, the future of labor, as if the future was the 15th of December 2032. But of course, we need to know exactly what we are working on when we are preparing people for the future of jobs. We need to know, is it immediate? Is it something in one year? Is it something in two years? Is it something in a decade? And this is very important. We have to be, uh, know what we are talking about. And I would say that it is quite easy, well, not easy, but approachable, 
when we're talking about current skill needs, because you know what companies are looking for. You see a lot of companies saying that, I think 60%, according to some reports, saying they don't find the talent that they need. And in fact, but this is, I would say, the easiest for us in the education sector because it's there, now you can ask the companies what skills you need, and we can adapt the education system for that. The things become more complex if we're talking about tomorrow's future. So the future in a decade, in five years, in three years, because they, I think, much more important than trying to pinpoint what is the skill of the future or the skills of the future is we've got to be capable of being adaptive flexible. We have to have education systems that are in contact with the economic and social developments in the context where they are working, working with companies, working with public employment services, working with new municipalities, understand where is the strategy of the Basque region in the future, and making sure that the education system is capable of responding to this uh, challenge. I think, you know, a message I'd also like to pass is that change has been constant. If you look since the agriculture revolution thousands of years ago, there's constantly been change. Change. What I think is fundamentally different now is the speed and the uncertainty. You know, when we had the Industrial Revolution, we could prepare the education system so that people had the skills to participate in it. We had time to do things. There's no time to do things any longer. The education system is confronted with constant change. And when you are prepared for the change that you've been preparing in the last year, things have changed again. So this level of uncertainty and speed is, I think, what differentiates the change we have today compared to the past. And just, you've all seen this before from Charles Darwin, that you know the species that survives is not necessarily the most intelligent or the strongest, it's the one that is capable of adapting to change. And I think change is the key word of uh, what I'd like to uh, explain to you today. So the truth is that, in fact, when we're talking about the future of skills, and I, the challenge I had was to talk about the future of work and skills, of course we have we, ideas of where it is going. And of course we have to prepare the education system for that. But I would say that the truth is that nobody really knows. We don't know. I mean, three years ago, who could have imagined COVID? Who can the, could have imagined that millions of people all over the world from one day to the other would change the ways of teaching and learning? Teachers would be in front of a computer. Learners would be in front of a computer home. Those that had the luck to have good internet uh, connection and a good computer at home. Our life changed radically because of COVID. Then we had the Russian invasion of Ukraine when we thought we were recovering from COVID. Disrupted our lives completely, disrupted the education system in Europe with all the migrants we had to come. We don't know what might come tomorrow, another pandemic. So I think that the important thing is that although we don't know what will be the future, what we do know is what we want from the future of jobs in Europe. We want jobs to be fair, we want them to be inclusive, and we want them to provide opportunities for all. And it is precisely because of this, this human-centered, this development, not for the sake of development itself, but development for people. Because at the end of the day, if we don't think of our countries of innovation, of competitiveness, of uh, uh, economic development centered in people, it's just worth what it is, development. And what we've tried to do in Europe, and with this European pillar of social rights, is define 20 key principles that should underpin everything we do for the future of work in Europe, the European social model, if you want. And there are four of these principles that touch, in particular, on education and training. The first one is to ensure that everyone has access to education and training in a lifelong learning perspective, but then, can I get back this? Oh, thank you. And, uh, but then these four are then complemented with others. I will not get into detail on it, but it sort of designs what is the social model we, have in, we want to have in Europe, irrespective of wherever the future of work will go. And in this context, we have three big targets. In all of them, you'll see that education and training is fundamental to it. Of course, the participation of adults in lifelong learning, we want 60% of all adults participating continuously in lifelong learning. Education is fundamental there. For unemployment levels and reducing poverty, of course, you know that in order for people to be more employable, skills is fundamental. And also to reduce poverty, skills once again is 
fundamental in this uh, transition. I had another question, unfortunately it doesn't work, because I wanted to have your opinion on where will upskilling and reskilling uh, uh, be in the future. Will it be taking place in vet centers? Will it be taking place in universities? Will it be taking place at the workplace? And I'd like your opinion on it, so I hope that one day this works and I could get it. But what I wanted to end my presentation with is tell you that in Europe what we are doing Irrespective of whatever scenario, and this has to do with the adaptability of the system, whatever scenario, we've got a strategy for skills, we've got the financial means, we've got tools, and we have initiatives that are, I'm going to now briefly describe you what they are. In terms of the big policy framework we have in Europe, so we are coordinating policies in 27 member states, we have the European Skills Agenda focusing on the upskilling and reskilling of adults, we've got the European Education Area where it is not only looking at VET, but seeing how VET relates to schools, how VET relates to universities, so that we have, as the name says, a European education area in which all of these different elements are working together in order to provide both young and adults with the skills they need for the future. And if you want to have a look into what we are doing in vocational education and training, I don't have the time to get in detail here, but if you go to that website there and you will get copies of this presentation, you'll get all the details of what we are doing in vocational education and training. In terms of funding, because you know it's very good to have big strategic ideas, but if you don't have the money to put them to work, you're going nowhere. So Europe has put very substantial amounts of money. We're talking about two trillion euros for the current programming period. So not million, not billion, trillion euros. Of course, not of all of it for skills. It has to do with the, uh, uh, you know, the green and digital transition in Europe. But you've got a very substantial amount of it also for skills. Because we believe that if you think of the green and digital transition, but you don't think of the skills that are needed for this, it's just a strategy and nothing more than it. And of course, we also have very important tools to support the stakeholders throughout Europe and even uh, outside Europe. And we have a particular agency that uh, my friend James Kalech is very familiar with, CEDEFOP, that is working on this. Some of this work was initiated while, he, in fact, he was a director of the agency, that is trying to help people by looking at the, what is the demand in skills. So developing skills intelligence, trying to understand where will replacement demand uh, be uh, there, where will emerge demand be and they are also developing crawlers that go all over the web try to see where job advertisements are what are the skills that are being demanded they are working on this and making this uh, uh, available for everyone just tap in Google uh, CEDEFOP skills intelligence and you'll see the amount of detailed information that you get then it's being updated constantly you have another tool uh, that we provide at the European level which is ESCO it provides a classification of of occupations and of the skills that are needed in each of these occupations so that it can better prepare for the future. For example, on green skills, we went through the thousands of occupations that are there, identified what are the skills that will be needed for the green transition in all the occupations that are there, so both existing and emerging. So very interesting site for you to, to check as well. And today in Brussels, in a few hours, I think, I'm anticipating a little bit, the member states are going to sit together, the ministers, and they are going to approve two new initiatives that we've launched recently in Europe. One is the individual learning accounts, so giving each individual in Europe an account, this is the, pro the, the, the proposal, that each individual in Europe is given just like a bank account. Every year they are charged with a certain amount of funding that will allow them as individuals, not the company, to decide what do they want for their investment in terms of skills, of upskilling. And the other one is on micro-credentials. Everyone has heard a lot about micro-credentials. It's a flexible way of making sure that, in particular, adults that want to upskill and reskill don't have to sit through a full qualification, but in particular, nuggets of uh, uh, skills, they can upgrade the skills and be uh, immediately active in the labor market. So these are some of the tools we are using. Not only that, we have policy initiatives. We have a pact for skills, which is trying to congregate efforts. It's trying to tell society skills is not only a problem for or challenge for education and training. If companies want to have the people with the skills they need to be productive and to grow, 
companies have to be part of the education and training system. They have to work with education and training providers. Just sit back and say and complain about the education system that is not providing them with people with the skills they need is not enough. Companies have to engage. Public employment services have to engage with local vet providers. They've got to work together. They've got to tell them we have so many adults that have lost their jobs, that are unemployed, help us provide these people with the skills that they need for the future. We have to work together. And this is what the Pact for Skills is trying to provide. We have other initiatives like the European uh, Alliance for Apprenticeships. You heard the, the Spanish Minister of Education talking about the, the dual training system. This is very much what we are trying to do, to mobilize people in Europe, to make sure that VET is not something you learn in a school, but it is done with work-based learning, working in a company, understanding what are the challenges in companies, and working together with them. We have another initiative, which is the Vocational Skills Week. It just took place. And this is aimed at raising the attractiveness of VET. I think in all countries in Europe, we still have sometimes a, a problem because VET is not seen with the same societal value as other forms of education. We've got to change this because we know that VET is helping companies to innovate, is helping companies to progress, to be uh, productive, and therefore we've got to show these good examples so that people don't associate VET as a sort of a safety net when everything else doesn't work, but really a way of helping society, empowering individuals to have fulfilling lives and fulfilling jobs. And the last policy initiative I'd like to mention is the blueprint for cooperation on skills that tries to address at the sectoral level, sector by sector, what are the skills that are needed for the future. Now, this is the last uh, slide I have to share with you, and it has to do with an initiative that we are working on, and I would say very much inspired. You heard uh, Jorge Arrevalo with all this you know, fantastic way that he has of presenting what they are doing in the Basque country, and I would say that our initiative on Centers of Vocational Excellence is very much inspired of what is being done in the Basque country, and I think for very good reasons, as you saw. And instead of me giving you a lot of blah, blah about what it is, I have a very short video. Some of you might have seen it already, but a very short video that explains what are the main objectives of the initiative. And then I've got another slide where you can see how to get more information, but I unfortunately cannot go into details. I'll show you the video now. If you want. So you can get more information here. You, these slides will be distributed to you. And the last word I'd like, you know, if you're uh, thinking about real estate investment and you talk with the real estate agent, you ask them, how can I ensure that I'm doing a good investment in real estate? They'll tell you location, location, location. Now, what the message I wanted to leave with you is that if we're talking about the future, empowering people for fulfilling jobs and for quality jobs and fulfilling lives, it's all about learning, learning, and learning. 
but it's not only about learning in the traditional sense, it's also being capable of unlearning, because sometimes what we've learned in the past conditions our future, and we have to have open minds to be capable to unlearn what we thought yesterday was the truth, and be capable then not only of unlearning, but also relearning. And this is what lifelong learning will be all about. We learn when we are young, then technology development happens, the green and digital transition happens, things change in life, we have to be capable of unlearning, opening our minds, and once again learning. Thank you very much.